TEDx Houston. Uh uh. Who? That's the answer. TEDx Houston. TEDx Houston. TEDx Houston. How many times did I call you? How many times did I call you? All these ideas that you have been sharing since morning. I can't hear you. Where you put all, where you bring all these beautiful speakers, brilliant speakers, electrifying speakers, you know, and have them all go first and ask a university professor whose task is to traffic in boring literary theory to come and close the act. There is. <laughs> I, I didn't know I had I had that I had enemies, you know, in the <laughs> in the TEDx Houston um, organizing camp uh, team. Sorry, and one other thing I forgot to do uh, during my communication with the team was to ask them to please um, ask all Nigerians in the room to leave, you know, <laughs> if I was going to speak, you know, because. Um, I wouldn't want economic um, ruin, you know, to come to economic ruin and all that, because um, we love our wolf too much, we love free. And that's because, you know, I'm going to start by talking about my grandmother, you know, who died in February, and why I wouldn't want to make that announcement in the presence of Nigerians is because she was 98 when she died, and you know what that means? It means cows, beer, party, and all that, because, um, you know, they would tell me she lived a good life and all that, and we have to, to celebrate, you know, mama, mama lived well. And so the Nigerians here would expect a lot of cowries for me, you know, to spend and all that. Yeah, but, um, so she did die in February, and that got me thinking about um, a lot of things that I, I learned from her, because she sort of co-raised me with my parents. Um, and that's because um, we were growing up when my parents, my father had studied in Scotland and had come back to Nigeria and was continuing his studies in ABU. My mom was sort of tagging along, also doing her degree while my father was doing her, you know, and every, all those absences, you know, they left the kids, you know, with, with grandma. And that put me at the confluence of what you would call tradition and modernity. So I got all the ultra-Catholic, my parents were very strict Catholics and all that, and then they had the, 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 the British influence and all this, you know. So um, no, no tradition, but grandma, you know, also Catholic, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, Catholic, but um, all the, because she was converted, obviously, but all the Catholicism, Jesus Christ, uh, the Trinity and all that, didn't stand in the way of Ifa and Ogu and Shungu and, and all that. So I got, so I was, you know, I had a very healthy, you know, grandma was the type, you know, who in my parents' absence uh, believed, for instance, in insuring me the African way, you know. So I got a lot of African insurance. Uh, those, <laughs> those of you from Nigeria, you'll understand what I mean, you know. Uh, the first 15 years of my life, you know, if you count the razor blade incisions on my head, <laughs> you'll probably end up with about 10,000 bere or so, you know. So that's, that's a way of insuring me. But she would ask me to kneel down, for instance, you know, and make the incisions and do all her if I incantations and all that. And then, pe, loru ko jesu, in Jesus' name. That's how she ended it. Beyond the insurance, beyond the insurance, she told a lot of stories. I'm, I'm glad that Mama Dolika told stories. She told a lot of stories. So I'm sort of the last generation of, of, of Nigerians, you know, who grew up on a very, very healthy diet of oral tradition, you know, the folk tale. And she, she told a lot of stories and all that. Uh, after my generation, I'm, 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 you know, uh, two days gone. 
His generation, you know, that's the generation after mine and all that. I was born in 85, was saying that. So they, you know, that's, that's Humpty Dumpty, Baba, Black Sheep. Uh, Mary had a little lamb. And um, all of them are here in this hall. Oh, McDonough had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. On the farm, he had a cow. E-I-E-I-O. And a moo moo here. Moo the bum. You know. No, for my generation, there was no old McDonald having any cow. You know, we had, we had the tortoise. And if you were in Ghana, you had Anansi and all these guys. So one story she did tell me, which speaks directly to what we're doing here today, because she, she also told me human stories. So there was this guy who was told that the only way forward for him, you know, he's gone to check out his destiny the African way, you know. Oh, you're destined for progress, you're destined for this, you're destined for that, you know, if I is saying good things. But you must bring for sacrifice in order to find that path forward, that way forward, and be able to identify it and be on it, be on your way, bring for sacrifice a pure white hen. A hen. A fowl, or oh, is that what you call it here? You know, what do you say? You know, I'm, I'm confused. I live in Canada. I worked in the States. This, I speak Nigerian English, so all this term, you know. It's a, it's a hen here, right? Chicken, okay. Thank you, okay. <laughs> well, it's, Ted is about ideas. You get the idea, you know. Uh, so let's, uh, let, me use, let me use hen for, the, for purposes of convenience. So this guy goes all over the world looking for, you know, he, he every... Chicken, he found, you know, everything, everyone he found, you know, plain white, pure white, but there would be one feather somewhere that just wasn't, you know, would be red, black, blue, and that disqualified, you know, yes, he couldn't find. So he started trying traditional signs, crossbreeding, this and that and that. No, he just couldn't find this pure white, unblemished. And then one day, he eventually found one. And then he was inspecting and all that. Oh, yeah. White, 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 white. Okay, I'm finally going to face forward and move forward with this sacrifice. And then just under the breast of this fowl, you know, pops up on close inspection this single brown or black or whatever, not white feather plumage. Oh my God, what am I going to do? I've been looking for this thing. So our friend, the African in him, clicks in. And he put his hand to the fowl's breast and plucks out the offending feather. <laughs> and the sacrifice was done, and he was on his way. Now, my grandmother used that story to illustrate something, something very profound in, in the Yoruba worldview, but which extends directly to what we are here to do today, you know. And in a way, in a strange way, connects my talk to my good friend Kenez, um, because I was excited when Kenez was talking about your hands, your hands, your hands. In his talk, because the Yoruba say, Owaraini, laughing to Araini Ishi, there is no greater determiner, shaper of your destiny, preparer of your fortune than your hands. So when the hand of that man went, reached for the breast of that chicken and pulled out that, that is the Yoruba world expressing the supremacy, the relevance of human agency. Human agency is fundamental so that in this culture, in this worldview, everything you do is supposed to enhance the instrumentality, the, you know, the life reinforce it, you know, the centrality of agency, the human. So when we're talking of all these African concepts, Ubuntu, togetherness, community, and all that, fundamentally we're talking about human agency. And that is why at this critical moment when there appears to be a crisis of identity in terms of where our friends here in the West are going with human innovation, human genius, human you know, science and technology and all that, then you begin to think critically. What's also happening with Africa? Because 
science, technology, invention, innovation, moving forward, cutting edge, all the language, everything is there. It used to be that technology, the West understood that, you know, somewhere along the line, man was central. And so you invented gadgetry to make his life easier, to make his work easier, to make everything easier, make life easier for man, human agency. But at some point, somewhere along the line, we got into post, a post-human dispensation. You know, you take man out of it. And so you have all these gadgets. Amazon is getting dangerously close to eliminating man. Now the robots are doing, they're picking out the books. Uh, the drones are mailing it to you. At uh, some point, there will be drones replacing you in your house to collect the something. Uh, the other day on CNN, is Zen still here? The other day on, ZN, on CNN, they interviewed a guy who was getting ahead of himself from Silicon Valley oh, in 20 years' time, medical sciences, there'll be no need for doctors, robots will do anything and all that. And I was thinking, maybe there'll be no need for patients. You'll put a robot operating on, you know, and all that. That's because science has changed a fundamental, from the fundamental philosophy of enhancing and making the life of man easier to replacing man and taking man out of the picture. But Africa says science, innovation, invention, creation, all that must reckon with human agency. Because history affords us of no example of any technology. We are undertakers. Man is, a, I hope I can say man here, this is Britain. In North America, I got to say person, you know. <laughs> I, I can't say prisoner, he will sue me, he's an inmate. I can't say prison, I've got to say correctional facility. I can say man in the generic sense here, right? So, you know, yeah, political correctness in Canada and the US, it just chokes me, kills me. You know, I can't say anything. But, yeah, so, there is a turn, a post-humanist turn, a post-humanity turn in the direction of science, technology, and innovation, and um, Africa seems to be insisting on a different path. We want in on this. We want to be part of this 21st century, 22nd century, futuristic world of invention, of innovation, and creativity. But hey, man, human agency. This was innovation. This was science. This was cutting edge. <laughs> we presided over its funeral. Man will always preside over the funeral of any piece of technology that pretends to replace it. And that is what Africa understands so well. So the philosophy guiding and driving science, technology, innovation, and progress is Africa. We've got to understand that it's not the same thing. It could be the same gadgets. It's not the same thing. And there's no such thing as science, philosophy, I mean, science, technology, innovation, gadgets that's produced outside of the context of a culture of thinking, of philosophizing. So we have to understand that. And so the question is, because Africa is insisting on that hand, that I want gadgets that would make it easier for my hand to reach the breast of that chicken, not chop off my hand and give me a robot chicken. Because Africa gets that critical message, then we have to ask the question. And I ask you, should Africa face forward? Answer me. Answer me. Answer me boldly. Answer me. Should Africa face forward? Should Africa face forward? Should Africa face forward? Face forward? Yes. The answer is no. It is no, because she understands, you know, the, the other day in Air France, I was reading an in-flight magazine, and they're talking about smart roads, the smart roads, technological roads of the future. So we have smart cars, driverless cars that are being, you know, I don't know what stage of it, so the human is taken out of it, gadgetry and all that. Now this smart car is going to be communicating with computerized smart roads and all that, and God knows where, and all that. So I was reading it, and I'm thinking about this thing. I said, the last person to think, of, you know, I said, okay, well, we understand that there will be man to preside over 
you know, the ruins and the funeral, to, you know, the funeral rites of even the most futuristic gadgets. And because Africa understands that, I don't think she needs to face forward. When I was in secondary school, we would say, Africa, face forward. Tautology. <laughs> Tautology. No, she doesn't have to. As long as she insists on the humanity that all the speakers today have in various ways, because that's what all it comes down to. Human agency, all these speeches, that's what connects them. So long as that continent understands that the insistence on human agency is not at variance with progress, with innovation, with science, with, with, you know, with moving forward, or face, she doesn't have to. Because the answer is, Africa is the forward that the rest of humanity must face. Thank you.